So the title of this slide, Will eVTOL Flying Cars Ever Take Off? We use the term eVTOL Flying Cars, one, because that's searched quite often on YouTube, but also because most people probably don't know what eVTOL means if they're not in the know, and that stands for Electric Vertical Takeoff and Landing. So vertical takeoff and landing, that's pretty obvious. That's what helicopters do, or perhaps the Hawker Harrier jet. And then electric, uh, an electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicle would be an electric helicopter. So when we say flying cars, we should probably establish what that means. So let's define a flying car. So if you take a look at the plane on the left that has some pontoons on it, is that a flying boat? Well, someone once said, I think it was Elon Musk, if you want a flying car, throw some wheels on a helicopter. Well, fair enough. but that's going to be too noisy so we know that uh, helicopters are quite loud so um, we can create an electric helicopter but electrification isn't really the way forward so what's happening now is you have about 350 different companies building these electrical vert vertical takeoff and landing vehicles which um, kind of look like drones and they have a multi-rotor design that dominates the uh, eVTOL aircraft of the future. And these will be a lot more quiet so they can potentially fly routes that helicopters couldn't. But an electric, um, say an eVTOL is not a flying car if it's restricted to launch pads. So if it just goes point to point, uh, in what makes economic sense to do, similar to what Blade Air does today with helicopters that flies fixed routes, then that would hardly be considered a car. Perhaps that might be more considered like a bus than a car or let's say a mini bus. So really, uh, eVTOLs, the way that we're perceiving them today and the opportunity, they're flying micro buses that um, operate in densely populated areas, and that's referred to as urban air mobility. So we um, can look at existing business models today that operate urban air mobility. And that uh, first picture that you saw on this slide deck, that is of a city that's very dear to my heart, where I happen to be a resident and lived there for quite a while working in finance. That's Hong Kong. And when I lived there, sometimes I would go over to Macau for a bit of a flutter. And Macau, I think, 12 times the size of Vegas in terms of their uh, gaming revenue. So it's a, quite a remarkable place to go. A lot of the Chinese don't play blackjack. And when I would play blackjack, they'd come over and they'd put bets on top of my hand. So it was quite funny. I'd have a crowd of Chinese behind, behind me putting up huge bets compared to what I was betting. And it really made for sort of an awkward situation but it was an interesting experience. And one way to get to Macau is to take a helicopter. And you can take one of these seen in this picture. It takes 15 minutes and it costs around $500. Or you can do what I did, which is to take the ferry, which takes about, it's a high-speed ferry, takes about an hour and costs you about $20. So um, this is one example of a urban air mobility route. And there are plenty others offered by Blade Air. So the question is, how much is time worth? Most of us have more time than money. So that uh, Hong Kong to Macau route, that's actually $550 for 15 minutes versus $20 for an hour. And needless to say, most people opted for the ferry. There's a lot more ferry traffic going to Macau than helicopters, though I, my office was close to that uh, launch pad, and I'd see them take off all the time. It certainly got some use. There's a lot of rich people in Hong Kong. Um, so if you look at what they're charging here, Blade Air Mobility, they charge $195 for 20-mile airport transfer. It's about $10 a mile. Look at Sky Shuttle Helicopters in Hong Kong. They're charging $550 for 41 miles. That's Hong Kong to Macau. So it's about $13.40 a mile. Now, Blade Air, we did a piece on them. I'll put that in the description of this video, along with the research piece that our analysts produced, who uh, took a report from Deloitte and based this entire um, presentation on that report. And we'll talk about that in a second. But 
um, Blade Air, when we investigated that firm, they believe that eVTOL aircraft will be on par with choppers in terms of the cost to operate their routes initially, if not a bit more expensive. That's what they've said. When it comes to pilots, you need to train pilots. You can't just start recruiting pilots, commercial airliner pilots, which there's already a pilot shortage. So that presents an issue, but you're going to have to have pilots initially, and that's going to cost money. Autonomy will probably bring the price point within range of what these EV toll companies are forecasting. And certainly, this wasn't mentioned in the Deloitte report, but our analyst pointed out that carbon credits could help margins for uh, this particular method of transportation. So the report by Deloitte, I think it's somewhere around 12, 13 pages. We have a link to it in our research piece. You can download it. You can see here some of the assumptions they've made that we have a problem with. The first would be the $3 per seat mile. So that number was taken from Joby Aircraft. Joby's probably in front if you had to look at the firm that might come to market first. And they've used this very important input as a basis for their entire presentation. Maybe it would have been useful to see a sensitivity analysis around that more so than just using that throughout their presentation. But here you can see where they've shown, well, if you have a particular distance that needs to be traveled, it costs uh, in a standard taxi $55 and a premium 104. And then uh, using a advanced air mobility uh, route, which would be an EV toll, then it would be $75. Again, assuming this $3 per seat mile. And then they make a point here to talk about the um, how green it is. And that, of course, could incur some carbon credits, which is a form of subsidization. But it needs to be taken into account when we look at the economics. And here you can see the estimates from Joby on they're three dollars per mile and they say here they're running 40 flights a day that means they'd have to run a flight every 36 minutes 24 hours a day seven days a week and each of those ev tolls would need to have at least 2.3 passengers it seems very aggressive if you think what they would need to accomplish this to get to this point they'd have to spend a lot of capital in terms of the regulatory problems and building the infrastructure, building the aircraft, testing there, there's a lot that needs to go into this, not to mention how long we are away from autonomy, though that will be a lot easier if you're flying fixed routes. So when we look at the cost of EV toll, there's a magazine called Flying that we came across and the article we've linked to it is just excellent. This gentleman did all the work for us and what he did is went through and did some serious analysis of pricing. And here's a graphic taken from that article, which shows uh, various estimates. You see here NASA saying six to eleven dollars per passenger mile. Well, we saw what ten to thirteen in the examples that we looked at. But um, you could certainly dig in more into the prices over at Blade Air, in which these folks mentioned someone who did. And the conclusion was that, well, it's going to be more in the range of a black taxi, so a premium taxi, as opposed to being the cost of a taxi. Though we would argue with what we've seen from Blade Air that the cost is uh, significantly higher than that. So really, it comes down to time. And in that flying article, here you can see this is in Hong Kong. In the bottom right there, you see that red high-speed ferry. That's a ferry you take from Macau. And you can see the Sky Shuttle there and the two launch pads on the roof. And that's where you would go to head over to Macau. Now, the flying article uh, mentioned a couple interesting things. One was uh, comments from McKinsey that said, what essentially is happening here is that these firms need to build some of the largest aerospace manufacturing companies ever by units. They then need to build some of the biggest airlines ever by number of departures, and then build integrated mobility platforms like ride hailing that we have today, do all that in record time. That's what they're claiming that they're gonna be able to do. And all the SPAC decks painted this rosy picture and we've covered all these publicly traded eVTOL stocks. We haven't listed them in this presentation because we wanted to keep the focus on the viability of the entire thesis, but I'll put a link to that 
article in the description of this video. And Morgan Stanley here saying, for one company to build both an airline and an aircraft manufacturing business simultaneously is challenging and extremely capital intensive. Well, Morgan Stanley also talks highly of Joby, saying that it's you know risky, but it's something to, I, I guess, invest in what they call a, a gamble at that point without having proven their aircraft, having uh, received regulatory approval, they're in the process of doing that. Once they get their first route flying and they're starting to bring down some money, then you could probably say, well, that's uh, the first signs of traction. And then here's a comment by a gentleman from McKinsey who says, if you want to get high utilization, that's kind of fundamental to the, the thesis behind all these eVTOL companies, you have to fly a scheduled network. You cannot fly point to point on demand. So that's a very interesting comment. And if you go to Book Blades um, airport uh, flights, you see I've read that they operate anywhere from 15 to every 15 to 30 minutes. It'd be interesting to see what sort of utilization they're getting on their routes and dig into that. Um, we'll look at that in a second, but here's an example of the time. It says intercity Boston to New York City. This is from the Deloitte report. And you can see they've taken ground transport, which is cheap airline, which is even cheaper. And then uh, urban air mobility. And you can see here that they're projecting even cheaper out to 2025, 275 seat mile, and then 2030, 250. And still, those are some pretty darn big numbers. It's expensive. So this will appeal to people whose time is very valuable. And there's certainly a fair number of those individuals gravitating around highly populated areas. So that's really the appeal of eVTOL. Now, in terms of the profitability that might be realized, we pulled these numbers from Blade and they're just the flight margin for the six months ending for these three periods. And you see, okay, let's say it's anywhere from 12% to 20%. So let's say, you know, 20%, the mid 20s is, is where they might fit. But what you need to consider here as well is what Blade actually does. So we've always thought it was a good idea to use Blade as a good litmus test of how the eVTOL fixed route ideas um, might fly. And when you look here, they've actually broken down each quarter by three different segments. Short distance, so that's um, what we're talking about today, these fixed urban routes. Then they have their organ transport. You see that's growing quite uh, rapidly. They did an acquisition to supplement that. And then they have private jets, expensive private jets. And they also provide passengers, but they don't put the breakdown between jets and short distance. So it's, you know, they said somewhere, I think last quarter, 25,000 passengers. Wow, that's a lot flying routes. But what was the breakdown between jets and short distance? So you can see here that as of last quarter, they cleared around $11 million. So let's say that's $40 million a year. That's pretty viable. So that's starting to become meaningful. And there's certainly something here to watch. So I think if you know one were to really feel bullish about the eVTOL thesis, um, it would probably make sense to then further vet what Blade is doing and try to figure out their profitability. What we don't have here are numbers that show us how profitable those operations are for them. And you can see the dip in revenues in um, that would have been late last year in December there. That's when they shut off their um, airport routes because of uh, a decrease in uh, airport traffic. But uh, they've since resumed those and revenues are climbing again. But Blade is certainly a model that we can look at. Again, if Blade is operating at $10, a cost of $10 per mile, then when EV tolls come on the scene, that ought to be where they're around. Why would an EV toll be cheaper to fly, especially when you consider the capital outlay that needs to happen up front? Why would those need to be cheaper than helicopters? And Blade is planning on bringing in some EV toll aircraft and to start flying them fairly soon, I believe. So we should get a pretty good idea of how well that works. Blade is a company to watch. So the conclusion here, that Deloitte report was brought to our attention by a subscriber and um, it was a lot of uh, people who read and subscribe to our work um, help by sharing 
different artifacts they come across and different ideas. And then it's a bit of a community where everybody contributes and we all learn from it. This report uh, didn't make for a very compelling case if you consider the price assumption. So sure, everything looks great at $3 per mile cost, but if you look at what is actually being paid with choppers, and if you move that over to EV tolls, how does that decrease without considering that it's been scaled already for five years and it's now running autonomy? Maybe you can achieve those costs at autonomy, but we're a long way from even having these things fly with pilots. So commercialization is supposed to happen in less than two years. Seems a bit aggressive. You got regulatory hurdles. They're uh, still trying to go through manufacturing challenges. And of course, the infrastructure that needs to be developed, these point to points. And you could say that, well, um, Blade's already made some great progress on establishing fixed routes and we're um, interested to see how that progresses for them. So the biggest advantage to flying eVTOL aircraft if you're a commuter is time. And um, of course, they're gonna have to figure out the pilot problem until autonomy is reached and at which point uh, maybe then costs could be brought down to something that would compete with um, ride sharing. But until then, uh, it doesn't seem like that's the case. So please put your comments in the comment section, share this video uh, with your friends and family, and thanks for taking the time to watch this today.